Well, hello again. So this is part two of chapter 18. And so we're going to pick up where we left off. I hope you remember that I just told you how important photography was and there was a lot of other stuff going on. Um, but never forget that. <clears throat> so we're moving right ahead. I thought you'd enjoy this portrait, self-portrait of an artist. This is the artist, uh, Gustave Courbet. So um, our first movement that we're looking at, our first major art movement here is realism. To an extent, realism was motivated by a positivist rejection of romantic, romantic subjectivism. So that means this intense emotion, this attempt to make you get angry or feel something in romanticism, um, and also neoclassic idealism. So realism is just what it sounds like. It's just showing you a, a, a little window, a glimpse at something real and ordinary. Um, not, not super at all. So factual accuracy may have been spurred by the advent of photography. It was less of a style than a commitment to paint the modern world without turning away from the brutal truths of life for all people. The revolution of 1848 saw the, saw the overthrow of the monarchy and the establishment of the Second Republic. And that stimulated an interest in the real life of peasants. So you have Gustave Courbet here. And this is a year, painted a year after that, uh, that establishment of the Second Republic. Um, Gustave Courbet turned to painting poor and ordinary people. His painting here, The Burial at Ornans, uh, commemorates the funeral of Courbet's grandfather. It is not emotional. There is no attempt to make you feel anything about the loss of the grandfather, but it is just factual. Uh, there's genuine sorrow of mourners is contrasted by the indifference of two church officials. So it's just a bunch of people gathered around and opening a hole in the ground. Um, critics absolutely hated this. It's a, it's what would, we would call an iconoclastic approach, meaning that it is so revolutionary, it just takes every notion of art and throws it away and says, no, this is just, just, just what it is. It's just a fact. Um, accusations of political radicalism were leveled against Courbet and later against Jean-Francois Millet for his paintings that focused on rural life. So one of the, the, points of outrage. I mean, there were so many things, but I can tell you what the critics were saying about this is that it was just a funeral. There's not, not any indication that the, the person who died is an important person or that the people gathered around are important. They're just like small town people gathered. The critics hated the fact that there was a dog right in the middle, that um, there's lack of focus, there's a lack of emphasis. The people back here, this crowd, seem to be, in fact, leaving. They've seen enough. They're going on their way. The church officials are still over here um, performing the ceremony. But the major complaint was that it was too big that the French Academy of Painting had rules, had rules that governed things like who could paint what subjects. Um, There's a hierarchy of genre. At the very top of that was the history painting. And that, that genre alone required the large canvases. If it wasn't a history painting, you had to keep it smaller. It's normal wall size, sofa size painting. So this ordinary painting of this completely um, un, unexceptional funeral was 21 feet long and 10 feet high. So they said, what? Sacre bleu, this is not important. What, why are you painting it so large? And it was just, it was because Courbet just didn't care about conventions. He wanted to show ordinary people and thought that they needed to be elevated um, just like some important subject. <clears throat> so that's a funeral or not realism. Never forget that. So there's our guy. There's a uh, Courbet. I love this self portrait of his. To me, he, he looks kind of like Johnny Depp here. Um, 
So anyway, that's why I include this so you can see him. And here's another bonus feature of Corbet that I think is uh, really kind of amusing. So I think this is meant to be a mockery of painters of the old style painting of one of the things he was protesting against. Because we have an artist here sitting down doing his painting in his studio. And his studio is full of very interesting people. And there's, um, you can check over the crowd. There are musicians. There are people holding books. It's just a whole variety. There's even a nude model back here that is, I don't know what he's supposed to be doing. And another nude model here, a woman um, figures over here. So everybody's in costume. Everybody looks pretty interesting. He's ignoring everybody. And what is he painting? He's painting a landscape. He's inside of a dark room full of people, but he's painting something he can't even see. So he's pulling a Bob Ross here, and uh, Courbet is mocking him for that, basically saying, if you want to paint a landscape, go outside and paint a landscape. So here's another one of the realists. This is Jean-Francois Millet, the Gleaners of 1857. So um, like... Courbet expressed one of the, the goals was to represent the poor people, it's like to really bring attention to these folks. So gleaners, even though it might look like a pleasant agricultural scene, um, they are really basically beggars. Um, the farm workers are back here with the wagon and the horse, and they've already harvested the field. They're taking away the, the sheaves of grain, taking them over to thresh them. And these women are the poorest of the poor. They have permission to come onto the field following the harvesters and look on the ground for the odd little piece of grain that might have fallen there. So they would just grain by grain pick it up until they have a handful enough to take home and grind it themselves and make a little wheat cake for dinner. So that's, that's poor. Here's another realist painter. This one is one of my favorites. This is um, Rosa Bonheur. She was a very popular painter of French farm life. She had to dress in men's clothing with police permission to make detailed studies in stockyards and slaughterhouses. And she did. She, she went and did a lot of sketching, a lot of studying of horses and cattle. Um, this horse fair here was highly praised at the 1853 Salon. So I think that's that's really kind of unusual. I mean, Courbet's paintings were criticized by the Salon, by the critics, but Bonheur's was, were praised. Um, so it's absolutely gorgeous. Stunning horse um, paintings and this action. You get a lot of motion. Just stunning, really. Um so it was highly praised in the Salon of 1853, which was unusual for a painting of farm animals. It was also really huge. So it was a, as huge as Courbet's. Maybe by this time, see it's considerably later. I mean, you know, a few years later than Courbet's, maybe they'd gotten used to the idea of realist paintings being big. Um, so it toured, like when I showed you the Raft of the Medusa, and I said this painting went on tours. It went to various cities and towns, and people would buy tickets. That's what they did with this painting as well. And then it was purchased by an American, and that's why it ends up in New York at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So if you go to New York, and you can go to that museum and see it. It's beautiful. Now, I said she was one of my favorites, so you get another bonus feature here. And this one is called The Dressing of the Vines. And it shows um, a herd of oxen pulling um, a, probably a plow here and some humans. But I, I mean, this to me looks as close to photography as, as it can get for a painting. Uh, look at the clumps of earth and look at the the rendering of the cattle is just stunning. So I even have a detail here to show you. Um, it also is noticeable to me that she gives a lot more attention, a lot more care to the painting of the cattle 
than she does to the man behind him. So she, he's just like a smudge of paint on there. He's just, yeah, we have to have a guy because, you know, they're not out there on their own, but it's the cattle who get all of the details. And look at the crisp shadows on these clumps of soil. Um, that's what I mean by it just looks photographic. Um, it looks like a bright midday sun shining down. On them. Anyway, this is Rosa Bonier, Love Heart. Now we're going to look at um, a, a painter who's considered possibly the most uh, influential or significant painter of the 19th century. And this is Edouard Manet. And he became the unofficial leader of a group of artists and writers who pushed the French realist tradition into new territory. We're going to see his painting Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, or the luncheon on the grass. And it was among works featured in the Salon de Refus, works rejected from the official salon. So a group of these radical artists, the avant-garde, the people that I told you were not mainstream, but the ones who were rebelling against all traditions, all norms, um, had their own exhibit. And this is how the art world changes and they get stirred up. So we're going to look at that. Um, in it, Manet offered flat, sharply outlined, and starkly lit figures who stand out against their setting. In a nod to Titian's pastoral concert, a completely naked woman is seated next to two fully clothed bourgeois men. The nudity was scandalous, as it was not part of any mythological or historical narrative, but it's within contemporary life. So he's depicting this scene. Let's look at it. Um, as though it's just a couple of people, um, the men living at that time in Paris, out in the country, having a picnic with this woman who has just removed her clothing. And that's why it's scandalous, because it's not pretending to be some classical mythology. It's just what it is. There has been so much written about this painting, I cannot even begin to tell you. Um, but I can also say that to many art historians, this is the first really modern painting. And by modern, it means that it's not done in any tradition. It is not depicting anything, but it is, it is what it is. It is just a painting. So he conceived it as an idea and um, not an illustration. So I think maybe that gets gets it across the best. Um, let's see. The, so all of these people were real people. They were identifiable. The nude woman was a model named Victorine, and I'm going to show you another painting of her. She boldly stares at the viewer, making us aware of our alienated relationship. So why are we looking at her? She is looking back at us. The painting style varies. The clothes in the pile on the heap in the lower left corner um, are sharp, cool colors, but there is very little modeling. Manet moves away from illusionism. And illusionism, once again, is that desire to make things look as real as possible. So Rosa Bonheur was the queen of illusionism. We just saw her with the horses and the cattle. Um, that looked like a photograph. It looked so real. And here Manet moves away from that and in an acknowledgement of the flat canvas making this boldly modern. So um, another thing that the critics hated in addition to her just frank nudity was that she's not even shown to be beautiful. Her um, naked body is not painted lusciously or with any attempt to make her look desirable. Um, it's just flat and uh, the shadows are sharp. Now let me show you what I mean by this. Oh sorry, these were the antecedents of this. So yes, I showed you this one um, when we looked at Italian Renaissance painting. This was the Titian and Giorgione painting. I said I would show it to you again. So there uh, Manet is drawing on history. He had two uh, or Titian had these two men with clothing sitting on the ground and two women um, serving them without any clothes on.
but the pose of this one is like this Italian print. Um, so it shows, and I'm going to show you more, that Manet is completely aware of art history. He has taken courses, he's aware of what has been done before, but he's making it his own. He's doing a unique twist on it. Now here's our other Manet. Um, this is called Olympia. This also was, was um, controversial at the time that it was exhibited, and it's the same model. So this is Victorine, and she's painted in a very similar way, very flatly modeled. Um, there's nothing about her that is made to look appealing or inviting. So her title is Olympia. That alludes to a socially ambitious prostitute of the same name in a novel and play by a contemporary French author. It's based on Titian's Venus of Urbino. But instead of a curvaceous and round nude, in other words, sexually inviting or sexually appealing, Manet's subject is angular and flattened. She is the antithesis of Titian's Venus. She is not softer appealing. Now let's look at these. So here are the reclining nudes, and I hope you see the similarity across time of these. Um, upper left, of course, is the one that we are now studying, Manet's. Uh, to the right of that is Ang's uh, Grand Odalisque. Down lower left is Cronach, a horrible woman, and the Titian in lower right. So it's these two that are the strongest contrast. This is what Manet is undoubtedly looking at or familiar with uh, when he paints this painting. So as I said, Manet's um, Olympia is not soft or appealing. The gazes of the two women differ. So now look at their facial expressions. Victorine in the Manet seems to be uh, staring at us without any guile. It's almost like she's defiant. She's saying, what are you looking at? Um, but the Titian below, we have that little tilt of her head and she's looking at us like inviting us to participate in her scene there or to join her. Um, and again, you know, think about the audience of these. The Titian painting was painted for the Duke of Urbino. So it was meant to be viewed by this man who undoubtedly knew that woman sexually. The Manet painting, on the other hand, is painted by an artist who knows it's going to be exhibited in a gallery. It's going to be seen by the public. And so you have a completely different context for it. She's, um, she's not ashamed of her nudity and she's just staring defiantly at us. Um, so now look, uh, the similarities are just amazing. So we have the poses. Um, their left hands are both situated over their crotch. But look at what they're sitting on. Their beds are both um, red upholstery with a white silk sheet over it. You can kind of see up here on Manet's. It is red. I'm not sure that the slide shows it that well. They both have animals. Um, Titian has a sleeping dog representing, of course, fidelity and calm and security there. While uh, Manet's has a black cat with its back up. It's like a hissing black cat. Both of these women have servants, like back here in Titian's. He's got two women who are in the process of pulling clothing out of the trunk to bring to her so she will no longer be nude. And Manet's um, servant is bringing her a bouquet of flowers uh, much closer. The background is similar. So both of them have this partition right behind them, um, a brown wall with a green drape on it. So now when you see all of these elements that are the same, you know, you, you, you have to know and believe that, that Manet is copying Titian or doing his own take on it. We can say that. <clears throat> so when I said that there's nothing about this um, <clears throat> that, that the French would have accepted as sexual, here's an academic painting. I told you I'd bring, bring you another one. 